So now we'll discuss the concept of enrichment analysis in the context of gene ontology. So let's consider the following motivational example for why you would need enrichment analysis. And so suppose that you are performing a genome-wide CRISPR knockout screen to identify genes involved in breast cancer. And suppose that your screen has implicated 20 out of 100 uh, genes in the genome uh, for involvement in breast cancer development. And so the question you're trying to answer with enrichment analysis is, what do these 20 genes have in common? Or another way of phrasing this would be, what are the underlying gene pathways that are implicated in breast cancer development? And so the point I'm trying to make here is that while your knockout screen itself directly implicates individual genes uh, and their involvement in breast cancer development, the goal of enrichment analysis is to really kind of generalize your results and be able to look beyond those 20 individual genes and be able to make a statement about entire pathways that could be involved in your phenotype of interest, which in this case is breast cancer development. And so the next few slides will go into how exactly you can uh, take these individual genes that you've identified from your screen and identify entire pathways that could be involved in your phenotype of interest. And so I want to briefly mention that the concept of enrichment testing itself, although we pose it here in the context of genes that you've identified from some, from some screen, uh, the concept itself also extends to enrichment of regulatory elements as well. So suppose instead your CRISPR knockout screen uh, is knocking out, say, enhancers instead of genes. Um, these, this kind of enrichment analysis technique uh, is also applicable in those in those scenarios. You just have to use different tools. And so here's a link to one such common tool called Great, which you can look at further if you're interested. And so here's a concrete illustration of how enrichment testing works, uh, at least carried out by what's known as the Fisher's exact test, or similarly the hypergeometric test. And so just like in the example that I started on the previous slide, suppose that you have a genome with 100 genes. And suppose you've done some CRISPR knockout screen and identified 20 of those genes as potential breast cancer genes. And now the question you want to ask is, you know, what pathways are implicated by this set of 20 breast cancer genes? And so one common approach to doing that is you would go to a database like Gene Ontology, and then you would basically <clears throat> go find pathways that you think could be interesting, like say uh, double-stranded uh, break repair genes. And then you would basically ask the question, well, of the 20 breast cancer genes my screen has identified, you know, is there a large number of genes that are also annotated as being DSB repair genes, for example? And so suppose in this example that of the 100 genes in your genome, 18 of them are annotated in gene ontology as being DSB repair genes, and the rest of the 82 are not DSB repair genes. And so further assume that as shown in this two by two contingency table, that of the 20 breast cancer genes that your screen is pulled down, eight of them are annotated as being DSB repair, which means that the remaining 10 DSB repair genes are not uh, pulled down by your breast cancer screen. And so the question the enrichment testing is trying to ask is, you know, here in this two by two table, we can see that there were eight breast cancer genes that were also annotated as DSB repair genes. And so is this number eight really big or more than I expected by chance? And so to kind of calculate, well, is eight bigger than you expected by chance? You really have to ask the question, and how many DSB repair, repair genes would I expect to have had if I just picked 20 genes at random? So instead of looking at my CRISPR screen and pulling down 20 breast cancer genes according to the screen, suppose I just picked 20 genes at random how often would I see at least eight DSB repair genes by chance? And so the way that Fisher's exact test kind of conceptually works is that you could kind of think about it as a permutation test, right? So imagine for a second that you have a very large urn or, you know, say a bowl, and inside this bowl are a whole bunch of balls representing different genes in the genome. So there's going to be 100 balls in this urn, and of those 100 genes or 100 balls, 18 of them are going to be blue, uh, 
which are going to indicate DSB repair genes, and 82 of them are going to be red, corresponding to genes that are not DSB repair genes, or at least not annotated as being DSB repair. And so in this permutation test, what you're going to do is you're going to repeat the following experiment. You're going to reach into this urn, you're going to grab 20 balls at random from this urn, and you're going to count the number of balls which are colored blue, right? So that's kind of conceptually like grabbing 20 genes at random and just asking how many of them are DSB repair genes. And you're going to repeat this experiment millions and millions and millions of times over, and you're going to draw a histogram like the one I'm showing you on the right, which tells you how many times you saw zero or one or two or three or so on numbers of DSB repair genes in these sets of 20 genes that you've grabbed. And so how you're going to use this histogram is that uh, your Fisher's exact test is, uh, at least a one-sided Fisher exact test, is conceptually similar to computing a p-value where the p-value is the fraction of all of your random draws, so your permutations, of 20 genes for which you saw at least eight DSB repair genes. And so that's like looking at the histogram on the right and asking what the area under, you know, the uh, area under the curve is uh, to the right of the number eight. Um, and so conceptually, if after drawing, after making a whole bunch of random draws from this urn, if you don't see eight or more DSB repair genes for any given draw that often, if it's rare, then what that means is that your p-value is really small, which is another way of saying that according to this test, um, it's pretty rare to see eight, uh, breast, eight DSB repair genes in a set of 20 random genes from this genome. So that's another way of saying that this 20 breast cancer gene set is significantly enriched in DSB repair genes, and therefore DSB repair uh, could, you know, plausibly be involved in breast cancer development. So here I want to provide a different explanation for how the Fisher's exact test works. So let's take our example of breast cancer gene screens uh, and our desire to check for overlap with the uh, double-stranded break repair gene set. And so suppose in this example that we have 10 genes in the genome, five of which were pulled down by our breast cancer screen. And also within the genome of 10 genes, we have three DNA repair uh, genes. And so the null hypothesis that we want to test is that the overlap of three genes that are both breast cancer genes and DNA repair genes occurred just by random chance. And so the way that we're going to test this null hypothesis is that we're going to perform a series of trials, or what are also called permutations, where for each permutation, we're just going to grab five genes at random to estimate how many DNA repair genes you would expect to see overlapping by chance. And so the point here is that for each one of these permutations, we're grabbing five genes because that's how many genes that our breast cancer screen pulled down. And so we just want to know if we're just pulling down five genes by chance, how many DSB repair genes would we see? And so the p-value that we calculate out of this Fisher's exact test is going to be basically equal to the fraction of these trials or permutations where we saw at least three DNA repair genes in that set by chance. And so what we're really asking is what is the chance that we saw a result or an overlap with DNA repair genes that are at least as good as what we saw in the breast cancer gene set. And so here I've illustrated basically five different cases using the urn example, where within each permutation, I'm just selecting a random set of five uh, balls, which again correspond to genes. And within each permutation, I'm just going to count the number of blue balls, which correspond to the number of DNA repair genes that I selected in this random set of five genes. And then I'm going to do that a bunch of times. So here I'm showing, uh, you know, the calculation for p-value when you only do five permutations. And so you can see across these five permutations that I've simulated here, 
most of the time the number of DNA repair genes that you uh, that you saw was basically small, so it was less than three. But for one out of five of these permutations, I actually did see at least three DNA repair genes. So I saw exactly three in permutation five. And so in terms of the p-value I calculate, the p-value is, is approximately just the number of permutations where you saw at least three DNA repair genes divided by the total number of permutations you did. And so in that case here, it's just the p-value comes out to be 0 0.2. And so oftentimes people use a, a so-called p-value threshold of 0 0.05 uh, to reject the null hypothesis. So in this particular case, we would not reject the null hypothesis. And so we, uh, we would basically infer that we cannot reject the null hypothesis in this particular experiment. And so a concept that I want to impart on you is the idea of statistical power of these enrichment tests. And so the general purpose of running these enrichment analyses is that if a pathway like DNA repair is really actually involved in breast cancer development, then your hope is that the Fisher's exact test or another test like it will yield a significant p-value for DNA repair, which basically then points you towards the truth. And so statistical power is related to the likelihood that your Fisher's exact test actually gives you significant p-value, assuming that the pathway is actually involved. And so there's a number of factors which influence the statistical power of this test, one of which is basically the size of the pathway that you're trying to test. And so the size of the pathway in this case is defined as the number of genes annotated as being DSB repair genes. And so to kind of illustrate the influence of the pathway size on your statistical power, consider two cases where case one is identical to the scenario that I illustrated on the previous slide. And so this is the case where you have 20 genes identified by your breast cancer screen. And in this genome, 18 genes are identified as DSB repair genes. And so in your breast cancer gene set, 40% of your genes are DSB repair. Whereas if you look at genes outside of the breast cancer gene set, only 14% of them are DSB repair. And so intuitively, there is some enrichment for uh, breast cancer genes with respect to DSB repair genes. And so if you actually ran this Fisher's exact test, you would get a p-value of 0 0.008, which is significant. Now, imagine case number two, where instead of there being 18 DSB repair genes, suppose there's actually only two in the entire genome. And so suppose further that your uh, breast cancer screen only pulled down two breast cancer genes. And so in this scenario, Actually, from a proportion perspective, 50% of your breast cancer gene set are actually annotated as DSB repair. Whereas if you look at the rest of the genome, only about 1% of the other genes are DSB repair. And so proportion speaking, your breast cancer gene set in case two is actually more, uh, you know, it's actually, there's actually more overrepresentation of DSB repair genes compared to case one. But if you actually ran the Fisher's exact test in this case, you would actually find your p-value is 0 0.04, which is obviously larger than 0 0.008. And so the point here is that um, when your pathway of interest is smaller, when there's fewer genes being annotated to that pathway in the genome, it tends to be harder to achieve significance using Fisher's exact test. And so another way of saying this is that it's sometimes easier to identify significant enrichment of pathways in, say, for example, a breast cancer gene set when the pathway is bigger than compared to smaller sets. And so that um, you have to consider the pathway set size when you look at the results of a Fisher's exact test or an enrichment analysis. And, you know, when you're trying to think about whether you believe the results of, of that particular enrichment test. And so now that we've discussed how you would use Fisher's exact test to test for enrichment of, say, breast cancer genes pulled down by CRISPR-Cas9 screen with respect to 
a single pathway like DNA repair, then the question becomes, what do you do after that? <clears throat> and so the general idea is that when you do this kind of gene enrichment analysis, you don't typically just test a single pathway. You typically test, say, a larger number of pathways, like, say, a few hundred um, from a database like Gene Ontology or KEG or so on. And so what I'm illustrating here is a figure from a paper where what they did is they uh, they did a screen, they did enrichment testing, like the Fisher's exact test, for you know a ton of gene sets. And what you typically do at that point is, you know, what you have at the end of all of these Fisher's exact tests is a set of p-values, where you have one p-value for each pathway that you tested, um, where that p-value again tells you something about these amount of you know this amount of surprise you have for the overlap in genes between your your pathway and your uh, breast cancer screen and so what you typically do at that point then is you rank all of the you sort and rank all of the pathways in terms of p-values so again as i mentioned earlier smaller p-values tend to mean uh, the result is more surprising the overlap is surprising and so typically you would rank your p-values and your pathways and then kind of go from the top to the bottom, where basically the, the pathways represented at the top of this figure are the are the pathways that have the smallest p-values. So small p-values translate to very large negative log 10 p-values. And then the general assumption that you're making here that, that underlies these gene enrichment analyses is that pathways with smaller p-values, so those are the ones at the top of the, of the list, tend to be more likely to be important to your phenotype of interest and are worth kind of following up on uh, as opposed to um, the gene sets or pathways that are at the bottom of the list or that, for example, have very large p-value and therefore um, the result is not very surprising. And so that's the general concept behind uh, gene set enrichment. Um, some final considerations uh, that I want you to I want you to think about um, as part of this lecture is basically what is the effect of missing annotations? And so what I mean by that is that <clears throat> uh, in the last few slides, I've tried to carefully state that um, when you pull, you know, when your CRISPR screen pulls down a thousand genes, you can go to this gene ontology database and say, okay, well, how many of these 1000 genes did, that my screen pulled down um, were annotated as being part of the double-stranded break repair system. And so if you notice, I'm careful not to say which genes did my, did does gene ontology say does not, or does or does not, uh, you know, is or is not part of the um, double-stranded break repair system. I'm saying which of my 1000 genes are annotated as being part of the double-stranded break repair system. And so the reason that's important is because uh, the gene ontology database, one of its largest limitations is that it's pretty biased. It's biased in the sense that uh, the curators basically go out to the scientific literature and they say, okay, well, um, you know, let's find all, you know, let's find the studies that tell them, you know, they have functionally characterized different genes and let's record what functions people have identified, you know, these individual individual genes is performing. And so the reason why this type of annotation is uh, is biased is because, well, you know, not every gene in the genome gets studied equally well. Some genes like CTCF, for example, a master regulator of the genome, you know, tons and tons of people study all the time and characterize. And so CTCF is a highly characterized gene, whereas there's tons and tons of genes in the human genome especially like the non-coding genes, for example, but a lot of the protein coding ones as well, that just haven't been looked at by many people. And so they tend to have fewer annotations, not because we think they perform fewer functions, but just because they're poorly studied, right? And furthermore, um, not only are certain genes uh, studied much better than other genes, but certain functional annotations are just studied much more heavily than other functional annotations. And so, um, Basically, what the point I'm trying to make is, is that there's a lot of missing annotations in gene ontology. And so if you if you look at gene ontology and ask the question, okay, well, how many genes are known to be part of the DNA uh, double-stranded break repair system? 
you know, if the if the database tells you there's, oh, there's like 100 genes that are known to be part of the double-stranded break repair system, that's usually an underestimate um, because there's, you know, there could be tons of genes that just weren't tested. Uh, they weren't directly tested uh, as to whether or not they're part of the DNA double-stranded break repair system or not. Um, so false negatives or basically those annotations that are just missing from the database tend to be much higher than false positives. So false, a false positive here would refer to um, some curator annotating a gene is performing a function when that gene actually did not perform that function. And so the main question of relevance to this lecture is, well, if you have a lot of missing annotations in the database, then what is the potential effect of those annotations on this kind of permutation test that I talked about in the last slide? Like, how can that change? How can that either make your p-value, does that make your p-value tend to be smaller than it actually is? So does that tend to cause you to um, predict that certain pathways are involved in your trait uh, when they're not? Or does that tend to make your p-values larger than average? So does that make you tend to miss um, certain pathways? Uh, so what is, what is the effect of missing annotations? Um, and the second thing to consider is um, in vivo experiments generally are much easier to do on mono organisms than humans, obviously. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of functions, gene functions, and uh, you know phenotypic uh, assays that link gene perturbations to organism level phenotypes that you can do for organisms like uh, mouse or like worms or so on or chimps that you just can't do on humans. And so I talked a lot of, I talked a little bit about how electronically inferred annotations are kind of dodgy and, um, you know, you oftentimes want to avoid them where possible, but in a lot of cases or in, you know, at least some major cases, it, you know, the only thing you may be able to do is basically borrow annotations from what's learned in say model organisms like mouse. And so an important question to think about is, well, when does it make sense to map functional information about genes from mouse to human? Uh, when does it not, right? And so you could imagine, for example, for genes that primarily function in the brain, well, maybe those are, for example, um, poorer choices for genes that you should lift annotations from mouse to human over as compared to genes that are involved in, say, like um, skin maintenance or wound healing or something like this. And so... Here I'll leave you with a link to a web page where you can actually try out the Fisher exact test or what's called here the hypergeometric test. And so the idea here is that in this web page you can interactively enter in a few key pieces of information. So you can enter in the number of breast cancer genes that were pulled down by a CRISPR screen, for example. You can enter in your number of genes in the genome, as well as the number of genes in the Go pathway that you're trying to test for enrichment. So in this case, uh, on the previous slides, this would be the number of, for example, DNA repair genes. And finally, you want to also input the overlap. So this is, in this case, the number of breast cancer genes that are also known DNA repair genes. And you also want to make sure that in the drop-down box on the top of the page, you select the choice P of X greater than or equal to X. And so this web page is going to calculate two things for you. Number one of which is it's going to calculate the p-value of the overlap that will tell you the you know, probability of seeing an overlap uh, at least as great as you saw in your experiment by chance. And it's also going to show you a histogram where this histogram tells you what the expected distribution of overlaps is under the null hypothesis. So this is going to give this is going to give you the distribution of overlaps that you would get if you did a whole bunch of permutations where you just randomly select uh, a random group of genes uh, that's exactly the same size as the number of genes that you pulled down by a CRISPR screen. And it's just going to calculate the overlap uh, distribution and give you a visual representation of, of that p-value. And so this web page is useful for simulating a few different scenarios. And so let's suppose for the moment that we are testing for enrichment against a pathway which is very small. And so suppose in a genome of 100 genes, 
suppose our DNA repair pathway only has one gene in this genome. And on the other hand, suppose our breast cancer CRISPR screen pulled down 20 genes in this genome. Now, let's consider how much overlap you'd expect to see between the breast cancer screen genes and the DNA repair pathway by chance. And so that's what this histogram is basically showing you. So it's showing you that the probability of seeing an overlap of zero genes in this case is actually 80%, and the probability of seeing an overlap of exactly one gene is actually 20%. And so if you think about what that actually means, that means that the p-value that you can get out of this Fisher's exact test will always be either 1.0 or 0 0.2. And so that means that if your breast cancer screen only pulls down 20 genes, you'll actually never see a p-value less than 0 0.05 in this case. And so in this hypothetical scenario, it's impossible to get any p-value that is below the typical 0 0.05 threshold. And so if we consider you know, the other kind of extreme case where we're looking at a pathway that's actually very large, and so in the same genome of 100 genes, suppose instead that our DNA repair pathway is uh, very large, and so there's 99 genes in the genome that are part of this pathway. And so again, this histogram is illustrating to you what the chances are that you'd see an overlap of 19 or 20 genes between your breast cancer screen genes and your very large pathway. And so the first thing you should note is that this histogram only shows you, shows you the probability of seeing an overlap of 19 or 20 genes. And so that should be kind of surprising initially because you might say to yourself, well, you know, I selected 20 genes, uh, you know, from my CRISPR screen. And so, you know, shouldn't it be possible to see 18 or 17 or 16 genes in overlap? Why is it, why are the choices only 19 or 20? But if you think about it a little bit more, if 99 out of 100 genes in your genome are involved in DNA repair, then you, you know, only at most one of those 20 genes from your breast cancer screen can be not involved in DNA repair. And so that's why there's only uh, bars at an overlap of 19 or 20. And so again, what you'll notice if you play around with this app is that the probability of seeing an overlap of 19 genes is actually 0 0.2. And the probability of seeing exactly 20 genes uh, overlapping is 0 0.8. And so what again that means is that the only kind of p-values that you can see if your breast cancer screen pulls down 20 genes is either 1.0 or 0 0.8. And so again, in this scenario, you'll never see a p-value less than 0 0.05. And so you can never achieve statistical significance um, no matter what your breast cancer uh, screen pulls down as its gene set.